You know, on the movie landscape, Hollywood and America are talked about a lot. It seems like you can't walk down to the kebab shop without seeing a poster for Venom 2 or Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Five Wings or whatever. And it's great that America's doing so well. It's great they have heroes. I'm happy for them, honestly. But the question on my lips is, what about Canada? That small maple island with the, the smiley faces and snowmobiles. Where are their heroes? Surely they've got sick films we should be able to watch too. Films that are most likely being oppressed by the Hollywood elites. That's why today I wanted to broaden my my horizon when it comes to talking about films on the Mimulus channel and explore some true indie cinema that comes from the proper dark underground of Canada, like like the Canada that Drake talks about. The first film in this artistic exploration, if if you can really call it that, is Canada's answer to Hollywood's Avengers, Avenging Force the Scarab. Before I get into that, uh, you should subscribe or I'll, I'll kick your dog. <laughs> The whole thing looks like it was filmed on a ring doorbell. The costumes look like they're from Audi and I literally can't hear anything. There are people who want to get their hands on a secret and it's a little too long to cure. The film is about the pyramids and what really happened to them in a world of superheroes. We open up on a scene with an old dad, like, you know, the, the type that had kids real old, so now he's like 76 and still looks after kids. And a Hawaiian shirt straight from the Barbie dad. And they're looking for something, we don't know what. The film may have explained it in its five minute opening where there was a monologue, but you can't hear it because whoever recorded the monologue did it on a Logitech webcam. There are theories that sentient creatures from another solar system have visited us here on Earth. And I'm not joking, I'm not exaggerating about that five minute opening bit. There's actually five minutes before the actual, if you can even call it an actual movie, even begins. Where there's just like stock footage of planets and moons and stuff and someone talking over it. It's, it's, it's bad, it's not good. But the monologue was probably something to do with the Egyptians and a meteor that arrived on Earth long ago. It doesn't matter now though, because right now, old dad and Hawaiian dad are being chased by three bad dads. Run dad, run! The evil dads are led by evil fat comic book Bucky. Hawaiian dad gives his life by taking on three guys by himself so that old dad can try and search for the, for the thing they came to the woods for and then we never see evil fat dad again from this opening you can kind of get a good impression of the horrendous camera editing and writing we're dealing with here but it's not until the next scene that we really begin to see the appalling acting on display that we have to watch for the next hour and that hour feels like it goes on for about 10. Peter Weir is the, is the protagonist and he's, he's an archaeologist he's lecturing the youth on the pyramids at a university one of the students asked about the involvement of aliens and Stupid Pete immediately rejects the concept. That, my dear students, is the difference between science and science fiction. After dismissing the class, he's visited by the old guy from the start, who is, uh, I guess, a professor or something. They bow to each other, and Peter calls him sensei. Bow to your sensei. Which, because the script is so vague, or because the acting or directing is going wrong here, you can't tell if they're making a joke or if it's meant to be serious here. Either way, neither man is trained in Asiatic martial combat. It's really weird they do that, and it's never, it's never done again. The professor gives Peter a shocking revelation. He knows the secret of the pyramids. It's big. I'm guessing he discovered it in the woods sometime after the opening scene. It is a bit weird though, isn't it? How he found the secret of the pyramids somewhere that is clearly not Egypt and, and clearly not very close. But at least it means that Hawaiian dad's death was not in vain. You just did that and got destroyed! He tells Peter that there are dangerous men out to get the secret of him. But what's kind of weird about this scene is that Peter, who is clearly an ex but in Egyptianology. Is that a word or have I just made that up? Egyptology. Egyptology. And a close friend of the professor seems to respond to this earth-shaking news as if the professor is telling him about a new Tesco club card offer on Silit Bank. He's, he's, he's just, he just doesn't give a fuck. He just seems to not give a fuck. The professor tells him to meet him in his office later and he'll, he'll show him the proof. When they both go their separate ways, we get a look at, uh, at a, a mysterious lady in red. Oh, she looks like she's cool. She looks like she might be the best character in the movie, probably. Now, if you like that opening scene in the woods, you're in luck because they do it again. But this time in in the university car park and instead of Hawaiian dad We have we have this this guy called Jack who actually knows what he's doing now I don't know about you But I like my chase sequences where nobody runs but kind of just hobbles around all, all crotchety like in my opinion Your film is is dog shit It's not even worth putting out unless you have three to five scenes of people walking menacingly and this film ticks that box hard These three tough guys follow the professor and his, his muscle But they must have taken a shortcut because when the professor and Jack exit the building the guys in black are waiting for them outside as if they've been there for ages, but how the did they get outside before them? Now, what if I was going to tell you that these guys are going to fight, like, full-on fight? You'd probably say, George Mimonis, what do you mean they're going to full-on fight? Are you implying that the ensuing scene involving a fight of which you are about to discuss will be in any way passable for even a 2008 YouTube sketch? And to that I say, 
Um, well, yeah, it's, it's alright. It's not the best. It's, it's almost as good as Power Rangers. I mean, of course, the Power Rangers had better everything. But considering that up until now, the actors have barely been able to run, the fact that Jack could do the splits in the air is pretty welcome. It doesn't last long, though. The numbers overwhelm Jack, and the Black Terror shows up. Oh, no! What you're about to hear is going to blow your socks off. It was late in the evening. I was gaming harder than ever before until... Hello? Cat! How do you know where I live? I'm a cat and I'm hunting for mice. Without hesitation, he lunges towards me and robs my gaming peripherals. Everything is moving so fast, it's all a blur. I'm left bewildered, horn swoggled by the cat once again. Without a second to lose, I whip out my phone and check Amazon for gaming products. And it was at that moment I remembered. It's, it's Amazon Gaming Week! Get in! I'm being showered with incredible deals all until the 8th of May. My eyes are drawn to the Astro A50s. I'm shaking with excitement, but I still need a mouse. One that cat would be too intimidated to steal. I search for the Logitech Pro Super and you, you've got to be kidding me! Up to 25% off! I can't wait to watch the Amazon European Masters tonight because... It's arrived so fast! Now, I thought that was the end of my travels, but after trying to upload a, a photo of my biceps to my online dating profile, it turns out I don't have enough storage on my computer, so it looks like I'm going to have to enter the daily prize giveaway and hope I win a bigger hard drive. Go to amazon.co.uk slash gamingweek and you can become a massive gamer stud like me. Now, I think it's about time that I tell you guys the truth. The characters in Avenging Force the Scarab aren't original. What? The woman in red, the scarab, black terror. They're all old superheroes from Nad 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 Nador Comics, a company that went out of business in 1956. That's right, can you imagine it? Your granddad is sitting by the window holding back the PTSD from World War II. Grandson comes in and shows him a DVD box of Avenging Force the Scarab. And granddad smiles for the first time since his wife got put in his spliff. He thought they'd forgotten. All his favourites are there. Black Terror, the lady in red, the scarab. They put the disc in and this is what he sees. And imagine just get up out of his chair there, go straight to his drawer, pull out his gun. The actor who plays Black Terror in this film is like the 45-year-old guy you see regularly attend your local club. He thinks he's being cool. He thinks he has an intensity about him that makes him interesting and, and down with the kids. But Loki, you're just kind of like, this guy's a fucking loser. What, why, is, why is he not spending time with his wife and kids? They question the professor about something called the Scarab and he, he valiantly resists their threats. You're messing with the wrong archaeologist. And then Black Terror shoots him with a laser gun or, or something. We cut to Peter in his bed because, remember, he's apparently the main character even though we're 20 minutes into this film and we've barely seen him yet. He gets a phone call from Red who tells him not to go into work today and then he does exactly the opposite of what Red told him to do and goes into work anyway and, get, and gets beaten up by some thugs and is again asked where the scarab is. In my opinion, a film isn't good unless you have three to five scenes where men in black demand to know where the scarab is and this film, again, ticks that box hard. Peter, who is now very worried about the professor, visits his house to find out that it's been completely wrecked and destroyed. And by that, I mean some of the pictures have, have, been, have been slightly angled. Oh, God, what, what have those raucous fugs done? Amazingly, the professor is still alive after the ransacking and is sort of just lying half dead on the couch, which is a relief because by the angle of some of those pictures, you, you'd have thought he'd be a goner. Ooh. You're probably expecting the professor to go into what the scarab is and why these guys want it, you know, to get, get, to get the plot started. Because that would make sense to have that here with the dying sensei spilling out his knowledge onto his student student and uh, giving him a quest. But no, disappointingly, the professor doesn't even die and the plot doesn't get started and he can't remember anything at all. What? What's going on here? At this point, we're introduced to who I would consider to be the best character in this whole film. The premier main villain, the Joker to the Batman, the Green Goblin to Spider-Man, the Sphinx to the Scarab. It's the Sphinx, that's his name. My over 70 crowd will remember his classic run from the 40s in, in Nadal comics. But in this film, he just looks and acts a bit like the nostalgia critic and his base of operations is a mattress warehouse. Very scary. His crew consists of seven out of shape bearded men with very, very real and definitely not just toy guns and two women in Halloween costumes. He asks the two henchmen if they have retrieved the scarab. They say no. Not yet, sir. And then the henchman asks if he can ask a question and, and the Sphinx says no. Can I ask you a question, sir? No. But then just guesses his question and answers it anyway. He explains in the most drawn out way possible that the scarab has power and he wants power. He then has both henchmen killed because they didn't get it for him and, and questioned him. This scene is funny, mainly because they're in a mattress warehouse and they have made absolutely no attempts to conceal the fact that they're in a mattress warehouse, nor do they address the fact that their evil lair is in fact a mattress warehouse. From here we get the continuation of drama of the professor's memory loss. He's doing all right, it seems. He's smiling, he's relaxed. He can't remember anything though. So I guess the secrets of the pyramids are, are, are lost forever. 
forever. No, no, wait. Peter found a key. We find out what the key is for immediately, which is very convenient. We see him go to some kind of storage facility and use the key to receive a bit of parchment. And I don't know about you, but at this point in the movie, I was just itching for another slow walking chase scene. And my prayers were answered. But you know what would really top this off? If the men demand to know where the scarab was again. Oh! Our employer is very interested in that piece of parchment you're holding in your hands. That's two birds with one stone. Could this scene get any better? It's, it's red! For those who don't know, the lady in red was like the very first female superhero. Like before Wonder Woman and Captain Marvel, she's the OG. I've been kind of building her up in this video as this, as this mysterious character, but I was only really doing that to keep it more entertaining for you. They introduce her right at the start and she, she's definitely the worst actor in this. She says all her lines with this stupid grin and sounds like a toy with stock recordings that play when you press it. Likewise, General Carter. To what do I owe this honor? She saves Peter from more questioning and, and the threat of being beaten up again. But, oh no, the, the goons get the parchment thing, which I, I think is bad. It must lead to the scarab, right? So, what, what actually is the scarab? If only we had a long and tedious scene where Red blandly explains everything to Peter in a dimly lit underdressed apartment. Oh, wait, we get that! Yeah, thank God! So, here are some bullet points to keep you guys up to date. Red is a secret agent that works for the government, and Sphinx used to be one too, but is now evil. They, they don't explain why they wear masks and costumes, though. That's still a mystery to me. The scarab is a really powerful ancient stone which is somehow responsible for the pyramids and, and, and also aliens. The parchment thing doesn't actually lead you to the scarab. It just has the same runes on it which means it has some of the same powers for some reason. The professor has hidden the scarab somewhere and it's, and it's a race against the clock to find it. Red encourages Peter to search inside his mind and memories for any clue the professor might have given him as to where the scarab might be. This is when Peter realises that when the professor told him to meet him in his office earlier, that was a clue that, that the scarab is in his office. From here, we go back to the mattress warehouse, my favorite location. The Sphinx, like, the last few days is still st stood on top of his warehouse balcony. I don't know why he seems to be eternally locked to that spot on that balcony like like an Assassin's Creed NPC, but th that's where he is. So I, I, I guess he likes it. This time, the goons that have come back have managed to half achieve their goals. They got the runes, but they couldn't find the scarab, so instead of killing them, Sphinx offers his goons the option to, to run the gauntlet. Now, the gauntlet may sound epic. It may sound awesome, in fact. But it's, it's actually not. All of the Sphinx's henchmen line up and, and start punching and, and kicking the people that are running the gauntlet. It's, it's basically a bully circle. That's what it is. But instead of kids traumatizing another child, it's a bunch of sweaty blokes and, and women throwing hands at, at the guys running the gauntlet. No one is hitting convincingly. The, the sound is out of sync. And they put this awful slow motion effect on it several times. I'm, I'm guessing it's meant to be a disturbing scene to set up the threat of the Sphinx and the, and the horrors that he is capable of. But it just comes off like a bunch of grown adults pretending to be WWE wrestlers in a mattress warehouse, which is basically exactly what it is. Sphinx gets the news that his loyal sidekick Mystic can read the runes. Sphinx then says, I believe the time for dominating this world is indeed upon us. Meanwhile, Pete and Red are at the professor's office and they can't seem to find the scarab anywhere. Red again asks Peter to search his mind and memories for a clue as to where the scarab might be. After some struggling, she again tells him to remember the exact words the professor used when he asked Peter to meet him at the office. Peter remembers that the professor told him that his proof would floor him and realizes the scarab must be under the floorboards. Red says she's going to pull out the floorboards, but kind of just stands around awkwardly while Peter does it. And he immediately finds the scarab, which kind of just looks like an old lady brooch you find at a charity shop. When Peter touches it, he gets transported into green screen land and is spoken to by a shit stock lighting effect. He's the chosen one or something power of Egypt. You get the point. Peter returns back to the office in one of the jankiest costumes I've ever seen. And he, he has become the scarab now. And with that transformation, comes a whole vibe switch. He's now like a, a robot bird man that has just discovered human emotions for the first time. Red demands Peter to find clues. There has to be a clue around here somewhere as to where the Sphinx is hiding. Why, why would there be a clue relating to the Sphinx in the professor's office? Why, why, does, why does Red think that? But then all of a sudden Scarab senses that there, there's guards downstairs and we now see the full power of the Scarab and the power of a bloke with 2008 Sony Vegas effects. He, he shoots lightning at one guy and punches the other guy in front him into some boxes. He uses his powers to search the mind of one of the fogs to reveal the secret location of the Sphinx, and you'll never guess where it is. It's, it's, it's the mattress warehouse. Everyone's favorite uncle, the Black Terror, is also there, but he's, he's kind of hiding like a few feet away, and, and he, he has a gun, and he wants to shoot them. 
for money. But since Peter is now the scarab, he now has a hard impenetrable shell around his body. And it might just look like a cheap gimp suit to you. But trust me, bullets just bounce right off it. It's incredible. Since Black Terror only has a gun, he's just kind of like a, a guy wearing makeup with a gun. There's, there's not much he can really do against that. So they just offer him more money to change sides. And he agrees because as we've already established, this guy will do anything for some, some sweet Canada money. And thus, the avenging force has assembled. But before they take on Mr. Sphinx, Red wants everyone to go back to the professor's office to find more clues. They don't find any clues or anything, so this bit is just basically filler. But what we do see is that more of the intricacies of the professor's crap office. He's, he's got DVD box sets, little plastic dragons, and, and two big boxes marked eBay unlisted for some reason. I'm, I'm going to take a wild guess and say this isn't part of the set. And they just kind of made do with whatever was in the storage cupboard they were shooting in for some reason. And so our heroes are now all set for the final showdown with the Sphinx, who, because he has the runes, has listened in on all the planning our heroes have made. Oh, oh no! Black Terror tells the other two some exclusive intel, warning them that the mattress warehouse will be swarmed with a hundred guards, all armed to the teeth. But Sphinx, in his genius hearing all of this, probably wanting the advantage of surprise, must have cut his guards down by at least 92, because there's, <laughs> there's like eight people here. They arrive and put their highly tactical plan into action, which from what I've gathered was just to go in and do a fight. Black Terror does some shooting. Red fights evil Red, proving that she is the most formidable character dressed in red. And the Scarab and the Sphinx interlock in an epic showdown held in, in a storage room. This it nearly gets Scarab at first, but then Scarab clobbers her in the face. And he tries to shoot Sphinx with lightning, but uh-oh, it, it doesn't work. Sphinx uses his power of the runes to absorb all of the Scarab's attacks. And I, my, my heart is racing at this point. I don't know what I'd do if Scarab doesn't come out on top of this. Eventually, the other heroes get overwhelmed by the eight guards. And they capture Black Terror. And Sphinx is all like, I'll kill Black Terror unless you run the gauntlet. And Scarab is all like, oh, don't kill my friend. I don't want him to die, please. And so, and so he runs the gauntlet. And for some reason at this bit, they didn't get enough footage. So they just had to reuse the same footage of the Scarab just getting punched over and over again. And I'm not sure what happened to his powers. I, I don't know why he didn't just use them here. But maybe the Sphinx sucked them out of him. I, I don't know. I honestly don't know why I'm questioning the logic of this film at this point. It's like trying to take logic from an 11 year old YouTube video. When all seems lost, Sphinx goes to give the final blow. But Scarab catches him and forces his mind to leave his body. So now the Avenging Force have saved the world from the match. Man. Red brings them back to Nedor base, which is kind of like the Canadian Avengers Tower, and they form the Avenging Force. Now with Jack as, as part of the team for some reason, and his thing is he just kind of wears a morph suit and is called Double Dare. I, I, don't, I don't know why they introduced him right at the end of the movie. They were probably intending on making a sequel and this was like the setup, but this one came out so fucking awful that they just sacked it off. The team set off to keep protecting Canada with every bone in their body. The credits roll and in the credits we get to see some sort of like slow moving animated drawings of the characters carrying out future missions. And some of the drawings are honestly astonishing. It's like what would happen if you locked someone's dad who's going for a midlife crisis in a room <laughs> with a computer with just MS Paint installed. Even though they're what an average year seven could whip up in 10 minutes, all of the illustrations are more exciting and interesting than any of the film that came before. Now, you may be thinking that this film was bad and look, it's not good when you compare it to films that are actually good. However, you can't really compare this to something like The Avengers. Avengers. You compare Avenging Force to something like Sharknado. And honestly, this film can be pretty funny at times, even though the pacing makes it feel like it's way longer than it actually is. I was so surprised when the runtime of this film was only an hour because it seemed to go on for five. There isn't many scenes within it where there isn't something stupid or weird for you to notice and laugh at. That's a long, long way away from what this next film I'm about to talk about did to me. This film left me empty, a shell of what I once was. The film that did that to me was called Thunderstorm Return of Four, and it was written and directed by Brett Kelly, the same guy who did Avenging Force, only a year later as well. And you think with production quality like this, it would take at least four. And I don't know what happened in that year. I don't know what dark shit that guy had to do in order to get the better camera. But it can't have been good because the standards in four, this four, a thunderstorm return of four, whatever the fuck it's called, are so low they make Avenging Force look like the fucking Godfather. <laughs> Thunderstorm Return of 4 begins in the same way Avenging Force did. Same music played over the same backdrop and it's just as bad. Actually, before I get into talking about the movie, I want to just talk about something a little bit strange because three out of the four movies that I'm talking about today are available on YouTube, freely to watch. Both Avenging Force and the other movie I'm going to talk about after this one have around 10k views, whereas Thunderstorm Return of 4 has 1.3 million views. How it has 1.3 million views, I could not tell you. But I thought we'd just, you know, read some 
some of the comments, see what uh, see what the, the, the stands of Thunderstorm Return of Four think, and try and figure out why 1.3 million people decided to watch this. I wish Thunderstorm Return of Four positive. All right, good. It's a nice low, low, low. I love how they had to put low three times there just to emphasize how fucking low budget this is. It's a nice low, low, low budget movie for children. But I don't even think children would watch this. Like, children watch some crap. Like, just look up, like, the most viewed kids' videos on YouTube, and you'll see what I mean. But I, I don't even think kids could watch this crap. 8.5 star rating. Christopher Columbus Clark. Did we watch Did we watch the same movie? I don't think we did. A lot of the comments are about it being for children, which is odd, because it's not. Don't watch, please report this. And the uploader has hearted that comment for some reason. Your movie hits me like shit. I'm not, I'm not really sure what that means, but yeah, I, I feel the same. But anyway, back onto the movie. This time, instead of the Egyptians, they're pulling from Nordic mythology, like Thor and Odin and that. And despite Nordic mythology actually being pretty interesting and wacky in places, there is absolutely none of that in this movie. The plot is the gods have lost their power because no one believes in them anymore. And the only way they can visit Earth is by entering a person, not like that, who comes from a godly bloodline. After the text, the film actually starts. We get a sequence of nostalgia critic, like the, the same guy who played the villain in the last movie, walking forebodingly in front of a car with his crew. This goes on for about 30 seconds. So, you know, starting the film off with a bang, you know, getting the viewers hooked in and all that. They rob a museum and he says shooting people is bad for business and then proceeds to shoot a museum worker. It would be a shame to start shooting people. It's bad for business, don't you? The guy he shoots coincidentally happens to have a piece of the dragon's cross, which is sort of, sort of like the scarab in this movie. But it's divided into three pieces, so it, it takes even longer to put it together. Isn't that great? After that, we go to Asgard. Yes, this is Asgard. Where we re-explain the plot that was just fucking told to us in the title crawl. Except it's done by like throwing up JPEG images of Odin and Thor and shaking them as they speak. And they talk about their concern over the threat and the nostalgia critic unifying the dragon stone and the need to have someone of godly bloodline as their champion blah 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 you get it and it's possibly the laziest fucking thing i've ever seen not just the powerpoint presentation tier animation but what the fuck is this is that cobblestone shed with no roof just there to establish that we are indeed in asgard in case there was any confusion amongst the audience we then cut to the same house that got trashed in avenging force only this time we're introduced to massive loser grant he, he realizes he stinks and he's late for work i don't know why this bit is in the movie because it lasts for like 15 seconds and then we just cut back to the shaking JPEGs of Thor and Odin as they confirm that yes indeed we do need a champion it's a good idea to have ourselves a champion to protect the earth like bad stuff is coming and all that blah 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 you, you fucking get it Grant arrives at his job as scientist building electric robot for the government with one other guy who's his, who's his best friend called Earl and Earl is annoyed at him because like all massive losers in this world he's late for work Grant takes a call from the government and explains that their work will be done in two weeks L tries to get him engaged with the important government work they have to do in the corner of someone's student flat. But poor Grant just can't shrug off this dream he had last night where Nostalgia Critic robbed a museum and shot a guy. He explains the dream to Earl and Earl tells him that it, it actually happened. It, it was that bit at the start, do you remember that? But more importantly than that, Grant just can't get the name Susan Green out of his head. So he decides to just like get up and leave work to investigate the robbery he dreamt about instead of finishing the electric suit for the government. Also, what kind of person doesn't completely forget the dream they had like 10 minutes after waking up? We're now introduced to the other main character, someone called Detective Bronte. She goes to the crime scene and is told about the museum robbery, but there's one additional detail. The guy that got shot didn't actually die. The dragon's amulet saved him with its, its special Nordic powers. So I, I guess he didn't kill anyone and business is still booming. Sarah Green, the person Grant can't stop thinking about, as it turns Turns out it's just like a normal average girl who's being driven to her first day of uni by her dad. I just wanted one last chance to be your daddy. Who explains he wants nothing more. Actually, no. Needs her to be safe. I want... No. I need you to be safe. As she builds a new life for herself at uni. She promises that she'll be fine, gives her dad a hug, and then instantly gets chloroformed and kidnapped the moment she gets into her kitchen. Meanwhile, Grant and Earl are still just fucking about at the lab. They're about to go home to their pathetic lives, but Grant remembers he left his wallet on his desk. They then take a much needed 30 seconds to go over why Grant should keep his wallet in his desk rather than in his pocket. I think it's meant to come across as, as two friends just having a bit of banter, but it comes across more like two RuneScape NPCs that have gained partial sentience trying to make friends. When Grant returns with his wallet, he's struck by lightning sideways. 
And at this part of the film, I got really excited because I thought he was dead. And I thought I was going to be set free. But spoiler alert, he's not dead. Also, 4 isn't even in this film. Unless you count a shaking JPEG of Brett Kelly dressed as 4. Grant wakes up with special lightning powers. And Earl immediately just shoves him into the suit they've been building for the government. And it's, it's super convenient. Because it specifically works with electricity. And he now has electricity powers. He even gets like this shitty paper mache hammer. Which is meant to be a conducting rod. And I, I suppose it's supposed to be 4 light. And I feel so now's a good time to bring up the fact this guy's costume looks like Iron Man. Part of me believes that they're just trying to overlap as many recognizable superheroes as possible. Like for an Iron Man to accidentally appeal to people who think this movie is about these characters. Like I'm pretty sure that's the primary market that's driving these terrible straight to DVD movies. Partially blind people thinking they've picked up a four or Iron Man DVD. When in reality the only superhero they're going to be watching is, is Thunderstorm. But on the other hand at least Grant's in costume 20 minutes into the film instead of 40 like like with Avenging Force. And maybe we'll actually be able to watch him do something now. Maybe, maybe we'll be so lucky. So after a really long training montage where we see Thunderstorm play around with some, some hot dogs, he's ready for action. Over at the museum, the villain guy whose name is Evan. Yes, his, his name is Evan. The main villain guy is called Evan. Evan. He's taking names again. He breaks in, straight away shoots a guy in the head. Come on, Evan, you know better than that. That's You know that's bad for business. Everyone is so scared, they're literally petrified into standing still, looking vacantly. No one's moving or even reacting to what's going on. They're all just standing still with their hands on their heads. Evan is trying to find out where the next piece of the dragon's cross is. You know, that, that thing that he wants and, and no one knows where it is because he shot the only guy that knows. <gasps> I told you it was bad for business, Evan. He then chokes a woman for actually giving him information, which seems slightly counterintuitive. But no one's going to want to give you information anymore, Evan. What are you doing? Doing? That's bad for business. But I suppose it doesn't matter because one of his goons found it in the back room. Just out of, out of pure chance, I guess. And they don't seem to hide it very well. Before he can get it though, Detective Bronte breaks in on the scene. How or why she is here is not set up at any point in the scene, but she's, she's here now and she's here to stop Evan. Put your guns on the ground and kick them toward me. They capture Ooh. Bronte and start escaping with the Dragonstone fragment, but wait. It's, it, it's fun to stop pulling up in his 2004 master. Let's go! Not exactly the Batmobile, but it gets him from A to B, which is all he can ask for, really. He's a humble king. It's not explained how how or why he's outside the museum, but he's just, he's just here now, and, he, and he's here to stop Evan. They were going doing some fucking weird, awkward dialogue where they purposefully make him act cringe, and to be fair, they do manage it. Come on, Green, get it together. This is your big chance. Thunderstorm to the rescue! Ah, oh, that's so stupid. Thunderstorm then spots Evan and his entourage trying to escape with Detective Bronte. He tries to shoot them twice, misses, and then gets his conductor shot out of his hand and stolen. Here's a better shot then. <laughs> Evan takes the hammer and the dragon cross fragment. Oh no, oh no, what a disaster. He makes a hasty getaway in, in the least threatening car I've ever seen. It looks like the type of car Paddington Bear or, or a very Christian mum would drive. Bronte has a go at Thunderstorm while, while he watches the villains drive away. You know you can pursue them, right? You have a perfectly fine car that gets you from A to B. And at the end of the day, that's all you could really ask for, isn't it? Bronte then arrests Thundershock after watching him fight them and try and rescue her because she assumes he's, he's in cahoots with her, which is, is very awesome and logical. Thunderstorm literally achieved nothing here and will continue to do so for the rest of this fucking awful film. Meanwhile, back at the evil lair, Evan decides it's about time that he used the amulet he got in the opening scene to put a god inside the body of Susan Green by chanting the same thing over and over for too long. Yeah! We also possess two of the three pieces of the dragon's cross. Yeah! After the ritual's complete, out emerges the Norse god Hela. Oh! It's time for Evan to step down as the main villain and just become a subservient little bitch to Hela. She performs the role like an over-infused lunch lady who's always a little aroused. So what's the first order of business? Go and kill Thunderstorm because I guess he mildly affected their plans. They track down their office to go give him a lesson. After a very long, boring and awkward police interrogation scene, where Grant explains everything to Bronte that we've, we've already been shown and explained several times. Or we, or we didn't really need to hear it again. Actually, we definitely didn't need to hear it again. She agrees to let him go and help him stop Heaven and Hella. Since Grant is in police custody, he isn't there to protect Earl. who gets shot after necking on with Hella, and you, you can tell that gunshot really did some damage as, as there's blood splatter.png on his lab coat. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't get over this. Who thought this was fucking possible? I'm kind of avoiding talking about how, how shit everything looks because it's quite obvious. But how the fuck did that get past quality control? I say quality Quality control as if there is actually quality control in this film. I think I'm overestimating how much effort went into this. Grant takes her to his car and they try and make a joke about how cheap and crap it looks. Doesn't really match up with the suit. 
what gets me from point A to point B. That's what I'm saying. It just drags on for ages, and you're praying they'll cut away from the scene, but they just they just keep holding and making you watch the joke be unfunny for as long as possible. It is an electric car. After that train wreck of a scene, we swiftly move on to the next train wreck. They arrive back at the office to find Earl with that blood now completely missing. He slowly dies while Grant comforts him in the most cliched way you can imagine. He, he even screams no after he dies. No. No! Whoa! Easy, fella! After Earl's death, Grant can't see the point of it anymore and wants to give up. But Detective Bronte tells him he can't give up yet because the film still has 20 minutes left. That's all Grant needs and they rush off to save the day. And by that, I mean driving slowly in his car and making idle conversation for 10 minutes. If you don't mind slowing down a little, it'd be appreciated. Sorry. My mom was gone for a second. Back at the lair, Hella reveals the location of the final piece of the Dragon's Cross. We're an hour in and Evan is still looking for the Dragon's Cross. That, that should be the best description of how little goes on in this movie. Evan, is everything ready? Yes, my queen. He goes and gets it and, and then comes back to the lair. Not really any problems or anyone around to stop him, apart from Brett Kelly asleep dressed as a security guard. But they just snap his neck by slowly turning his head over, so th that's that problem solved, I guess. The whole time this is happening, Grant is in the car with Detective Bronte, being told where to go by the voice of four. The old playhouse then. He finally tells them to go to the location of the final Dragon's Cross piece. But when they get there, they're too late. So Four tells them to, <laughs> to just go to the evil lair instead. So they keep driving and the film keeps ticking by. You may have realized by now we are inches away from the end of the film and that Thundershock hasn't done anything yet. He's got his powers failed one time and since there's just been a chauffeur and a dump for shit we already know because there literally isn't anything else happening in this film other than Evan getting the Dragon's Cross to destroy the world. There's fucking nothing for Thundershock to overcome no personal struggle, nothing. Nothing drives the characters except, I guess, the voices from the Norse gods. Which means there's nothing for the characters to discuss or talk about other than the plot of what's happening over and over again in every scene. They keep driving for a bit until they see a giant PS1 dragon flying around, so they get out of the car finally, and, and fight the baddies. When originally watching the fight between Hela and Thundershock, you'd think the sequences were filmed separately, because it just keeps cutting to weird close-ups of them shooting lasers at each other. So you can't actually place anyone within the location. You don't even know if anyone's even getting hit, you just know they're shooting lasers. At the same time, Bronte and Evan are having a bad wrestling match. Bronte beats Evan by hitting him in the balls, and Thundershock beats Hela by hitting the dragon's cross out of her hands and making it break. You weren't holding it very firmly there, were you? After that, Hela melts, the dragon melts, and, and the goon fuck off. As a reward for all his hard work, Odin and Thor offer Thundershock the chance to live in Asgard as a god, as a mildly see-through, shaking JPEG god. Thundershock, although flattered, declines, deciding Earth needs a champion like him to protect it from evil. So he comes back to Earth, lips his bronze, he roll credits. Something I felt with Thundershock, which I felt far more than with Avenging Force, was an emptiness. It's like everyone on set at Avenging Force was having fun. Although the film was slow and shit, it at least had some momentum to it. In comparison, Thunderstorm, the return of Thor, just felt like like it was going through the motions. There was no attempt to give any of the characters or sequences any flavor. There was little to no pizzazz. The Thunderstorm costume is bland. The locations lack any of that sort of amateurish meme quality. They're all just flat and boring. The mattress warehouse in Avenging Force was a thrilling set in comparison to anything in this movie. It didn't even look like it was filmed on a ring doorbell, which although doesn't mean it looks good, it just manages better to conceal how shit everything looks. The whole hour and 20 minute runtime of this film is committed to telling instead of showing, which for a medium which is, you know, visual, seems pretty counterintuitive and it's boring. It's, it's very, very boring. Okay, maybe spending time watching Canadian straight-to-DVD movies was a bad move for me and my mental health. They're, they're not good. So let's go back to the familiar Americans. You know Americans invented films, right? So their straight-to-DVD industry must be leagues ahead of whatever the Canadians do. I'd imagine comparing the Canadian straight-to-DVD movies to the American ones being like comparing a 10-year-old child's YouTube video to one of my very, very good videos. They're, they're simply incomparable. But no, it's just as fucking tragic. Captain Battle Legacy War. I figured after the disrespect the troops got with Avenging Force the Scarab, it was about time we try and compensate for that with a straight to DVD hero that's all about paying respect to our boys on the front. Captain Battle, much like Avenging Force, is also based off a comic run from about a hundred years ago. But even back in the 40s or whenever it was, Captain Battle was a pretty blatant ripoff of Captain America. It ran for like 10 issues, copied most of the things Captain America did and no one gave a shit. Now it's public domain and Captain Battle Legacy War is just trying to capitalize on the fact that no one, not a 
a single human being ever gave a fuck about Captain Battle. By trying to convince us that this is some kind of long-awaited revival of a legendary superhero. I can see it already now. Grandad's sitting by the window, fighting off the PTSD and memories of Avenging Force the Scarab. Grandson comes in. Look, Grandad, he says. I know Avenging Force was a big letdown for you. Those were some of your favourite characters ever and they were ruined. I know what was done to those characters also felt like a personal attack and a, and a mangling of the era you lived in. But look, Grandad, I found another one. Captain Battle Legacy War. He's from your era. Does that excite you? Would you like to watch Captain Battle Legacy War? Maybe you'll like this one. I imagine the Grandad would tear his eyes from the window for a second. His entire body burning in pain from the arthritis and say... Who the fuck is Captain Battle? But just because it's based off a terrible comic, but doesn't mean it's also going to be a terrible movie. So let's approach this one with an open mind and positive vibes only. As we begin the comic book movie adaptation that literally nobody on earth has ever asked for, Captain Battle Legacy War. So the film opens and we jump right into the action. There's, there's some logos and an explosion which is cut comically short. There's a guy who looks a bit like Richard Branson if instead of spending his time building the Virgin Empire and suing the NHS, he spent it watching Rambo back to back all day every day. He walks out of a shack and into his jeep and chases a car. They exchange fire and, and none of the guns have any recoil whatsoever. This, this guy's shooting an assault rifle backwards with one hand and th that is absolutely no issue for him. He's not even pulling the trigger for fuck's sake! Another man arrives behind him on a motorcycle and we can safely assume the men he's chasing are, are bad of some description as they're all wearing balaclavas and and balaclavas mean bad men. Richard Brambo shoots the motorcycle guy in the neck and he falls on a hay bale and explodes. <laughs> he then shoots the balaclava men in the car he was chasing, but there's some other men waiting in the bushes with a bazooka and with a knowing nod, they rocket launch the man to his death. The baddies then take a briefcase from the dead man. The highlight of this scene would have to be the YouTube green screen explosion effects, which an idiot would say looks like that because of budget restrictions. But I know as a seasoned film expert that these are creative decisions made to show the unstable conflict which Richard Brambo is in right now. And you know what? Say what you want about this opening scene. Say what you want about the special effects. But at least this film opens on an actual action scene and not just like 10 minutes of pointless exposition. After this, we go to somewhere in northern Iraq. Where? Somewhere. Okay. It's a, it's a secret base. We see this guy who's called Brandon Storm, and he's a scientist who very much likes sifting through papers. After some heavy sifting, the conveniently named goody Sam Battle arrives. He looks a bit like Chris Evans, but he looks even more like Captain Battle. Sam and Brandon, they're, they're great pals. Brandon asks Sam how he's been doing as, as he's been away, so Sam kind of just begins to unload emotionally onto him. He tells him how he feels about his dad dying, how difficult he found the funeral, and how alone he is because he also lost his mum. Brandon is clearly uncomfortable with this conversation and politely tries to kill this, this this dead by saying he can talk to him about this at any time, which we all know is the universal underhanded way of saying, please never talk to me about this again. And to make matters worse for Sam, their corporal or, or whoever, this guy, this guy, he comes in and has a massive go at Sam for distracting his scientist. And that just puts his mood down even more. So to lift his mood, he does some, he does some patrolling with one other person to make sure no funny business is going down anywhere in Iraq. Whilst on patrol in a place that is definitely not Iraq, we know that something bad is going to to go down because it cuts to a suicide bomber for like 1.5 seconds before cutting back to them walking for another minute. And if the slightly weird tense music is anything to go by, the, the bomb man is probably in the vicinity of Sam Battle's platoon. And despite the fact this area is, is really open and they can see quite far around, Sam Battle and this woman get surprise attacked by two terrorists. Even though the terrorists are quite far away and everyone has guns, they still manage to get close enough to stab Sam. After that quite clear strategic victory, the guy with the C4 strapped him decides the only way that they can beat these two Americans troops, one of which is injured, is to yell C4 just in case, you know, you had any doubt that he had an explosive vest on and expl <laughs> explode himself. <laughs> It doesn't work and Sam Battle is brought back to base with just a stab wound to worry about. I, I guess the bomber missed despite being basically on top of them. But even though the bomb didn't affect Sam, the stab wound just got him on the brink of death. Their corporal, whoever, who was last seen screaming at Sam, says that the only way to save Sam is if Brandon injects him with this special secret experiment that he somehow knows about. Brandon injects his friend with this under-tested, understudied injection. And Sam starts tripping out like me that time I tried G Fuel. Three months later and the film actually starts, we see Sam in his apartment showing off his muscles. There's a knock at the door and it's Brandon Storm. They stand awkwardly in Sam's kitchen and discuss the serum he injected him with. Neither of the actors get up or, or move around. They just remain firmly planted in place like potted succulents. Brandon then invites Sam around to his hotel to continue discussing the serum. There's a shot of traffic, a page turn transition effect, and then we're in the hotel room. This happens a lot in Captain Battle Legacy War. Starting a scene in one room and then just transferring it to another to finish it off. Now the average idiot watching this might think that's bad writing, but for a seasoned film expert like myself, I can see it as an artist 
artistic decision and reflects the main theme of changing a fractured nation. A woman arrives. It's Brandon's sister, Jane Storm. They all get drunk in Brandon's small and cramped hotel room in probably the deadest drink session I've ever witnessed. And Brandon just falls asleep mid-conversation, you know, as you do. Sam offers to drive Jane home and they hop into the car for another long and tedious driving seat. And to give this film credit, it is at least better than Thunderstorm Return of 4. They awkwardly flirt and it hurts a little to watch. Then the conversation moves to, to the topic of Nazi skinheads, which are apparently rampant in the area. There were suddenly skinheads everywhere. There are so many of them, in fact, that the police just can't do anything. If only we had a patriot that could save the day and teach these punks a lesson. After Sam drops off, we get some shots of a parked car. Sam gets out of his car and pulls a man out of the parked car for, for no apparent reason. I, I think he's just doing this because he assumes he's one of the skinheads that Jane was talking about earlier, purely because he's bald. But there was one crucial bit of info that Jane left out. These skinheads can teleport. As we see a second skinhead just, just appear with a bat and, and give Sam a good whacking. I mean, it, it's they can't actually take, they're just, it's just awful editing. And this whole film's edited like this, it's awful. We hear police sirens and the skinheads run off and Sam calmly walks back to his car, pretty much fine as if, as if he's not just been beaten the fuck out of by a man with a bat. After the rumble, Sam ends up having nightmares about Richard Brambo's death, which, I mean, I think the film intended this to be sort of a mystery. It's something you can kind of piece together yourself, but spoiler alert for the one person that maybe cares, Richard Brambo is Sam's dad. What? And he he's the original Captain Battle. And for some reason, these dreams are like really accurate, like exactly as it happens, despite him not being there for it. After waking up, he realizes he's late to pick up Brandon Storm's sister. Oh no, so he, he just grabs her and they arrive at the hotel, but the door to Brandon's room is slightly ajar. They start to open it and then it, it cuts to them leaving the police station once again. Captain Battle Legacy War does its classic not showing the thing that's important technique. It's been doing since the beginning of this film for some reason. Brandon has gone missing, but instead of showing us the characters enter the hotel room and realize he's gone, they skip over it and the likely lengthy police interview scenes just to, just to show us Jane and Sam leaving the police station and go to the part where the characters don't, don't even want to talk about it anymore. They don't even explicitly mention he's missing. Jane just says she feels unsafe and wants to stay with Sam. You got to use your big brain and do mental gymnastics to figure out Brandon has actually been kidnapped. But that's not really important to either Jane or Sam right now. No, 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 no. They're far more concerned with how Sam's dad died and instead of looking for Brandon, they both decide it would be a more valuable use of their time to visit a reporter who Jane says used to know Sam's dad. Because yeah, that is, that is more important than finding the man who has been kidnapped. Yes. We cut to Brandon who's been chained up by a Nazi woman who is unfortunately rather lame. And like a lot of this movie, you pretty much can't make out what's happening because the scene just keeps cutting at awkward times. And every time there's a cut, the music also jumps to another part. Everything I've requested. Your cooperation. Almost like it was edited by a monkey that was given a 30 minute crash course on Premiere Pro. As far as I can tell, the bad lady is beating Brandon, who's acting all like Bruce Willis, like he'll never be broken. Bad lady goes into this lab area and tells fellow baddie called Tank that they're going for the girl. Meanwhile, Sam and Jane go to the reporter's house who may have answers to Sam's questions about his father. First thing the reporter does is stand quietly and awkwardly pour Jane and Sam huge glasses of whiskey. That's, that's like three shots. It's also quite clearly around noon. What kind of guy just cracks open the whiskey for his guests at lunchtime? Then the reporter goes on and on about Sam's father while sipping from his huge glass of whiskey. And there's some weird pan flute music as he tries to say some wise words. Men always have reason to do evil. Why are they trying to portray this man who's necking whiskey at midday to be some kind of wise Yoda-like figure? He basically explains that his father was a vigilante, but then stopped, then recently started again before his death. While he explains this, we see a flashback to the days when Richard Brambo was fighting crime. He wears all black and, and sneaks up behind a guy and slits his throat. It's, it's not really heroic or hope-inspiring. It's more completely psychotic. The reporter then gets up and they go to a different living room and sit in the exact same positions, and he gives Sam his father's old suit. This is honestly the whole scene and it goes on for seven minutes. After this, Jane asks Sam to drive her back to her place because she wants to pick something up. Maybe it's another waistcoat. Seriously though, what? why is Jane wearing a waistcoat over a dress like this? Who thought this would look good? She looks more like a magician's assistant than a reporter. When they get to Jane's place, the bad lady arrives with her skinhead goons and they kidnap Jane. She flashes her leg for, for no discernible reason and then tells one of the skinheads to, to keep Sam busy for a while. Sam tries to fight him off but it takes another L. I thought this guy had like some kind of super serum. 
I'm starting to think the scientist just injected him with saline. As they drive away, Sam tries to chase them, but almost instantly gives up. He then decides it's a better use of his time to question the skinhead for information. But when the skinhead refuses, he gives up on that as well and lets him go. You know there's only three of them, right, Sam? I've counted. There's only three. This skinhead with the goat is the same one he dragged out of the car earlier. Even, even killing one of the skinheads will give you a massive leg up in this fight. Okay, so now we find out what the what the baddie's big plan is. Bad lady whose name is actually Necromancer. So I'm, I'm, I'm just going to call her that from now on. Explains that with Brandon's serum, she plans on cloning Hitler, uh, allying with him and, and inciting World War III. I mean, it's a bit of a weird choice for a comic book movie villain, isn't it? You wouldn't get this in the MCU. But weird choice or not, it should be entertaining based solely on how mental that plan is. But it's not. It's somehow made boring and uninteresting as they, they cut between split screens of Brandon and Necromancer while she explains everything they plan to do next to stock footage. And now they have his sister, he will do everything they want him to. Sam Battle has finally decided to wear his father's uniform. He's got it all on, including the eye patch, despite his eye being totally fine, which seems very counterintuitive. I'd have thought being able to perceive depth would be a crucial part of being a vigilante crime fighter. But my worries are soon squashed because if you look closely in certain scenes, you might notice that Sam still lets his eye poke out just underneath the eye patch in secret, allowing his opponents to underestimate him so he can employ the element of surprise, just one of his powers. Sam is now gassed up to find Jane and by sheer chance finds a skinhead. And luckily, it turned out to be one of the ones who kidnapped Jane, which is which is fortunate since there are only, only three of them. So the odds of that being the case are incredibly low. Sam wants to know where they're all hiding out, but the skinhead just lies and says he's never been there. And that it's called the Wolf Slayer and it's maybe a farm, but he's never been there. But he has been there. We've seen him there. So of course, after this, Sam just lets him go and gives up, which is, you know, just one of his powers, I guess. Failure. Sam has another dream about his father. And whilst that's happening, Necromancer and her boys, presumably at the Wolf Slayer, have succeeded in effectively reviving a Nazi from World War II. Heim Heim Heinrich Himmler, another incredibly odd comic book movie villain choice. You know, one of the main architects of the Holocaust. It, do it doesn't exactly scream fantastical comic book villain to me. While they're reviving him, apparently something went wrong and it, it left his face all red. Kind of like Red Skull, but instead of having a good costume, he, j he just looks like he's got a rash. Himmler acts as kind, as kind of a muscle man. The sort of characters that are usually portrayed by the likes of Dwayne the Rock Johnson or, or Batista. And although I can't really say this bit is boring, I, I, I don't feel as though it's, it's in good taste either. Sam pays a visit to the reporter and lets him know everything we've already seen. The reporter offers his help but also states that it won't really do anything for the plot, which is true. Meanwhile, Himmler is training the mean three. Two out of three of them have been skinheads that Captain Battle has personally let go. One of them one of them twice. Himmler is making them do press-ups, which, which which I guess must be helping a bit. We get a montage of the reporter doing some research while, while swigging down whiskey, of course, and Brandon putting together the serum for, for the baddies. We see the mean three again, this time at night, and, and they're about to firebomb uh, something. It, it's probably something racially motivated, but this film doesn't want to get into the ideological philosophies of its antagonists. Yeah, th this is a family film. That's up to you to figure out and research. Captain Battle shows up, beats up the skinheads, and, and then Himmler comes in and just, just throttles him, so it's more L's for Captain Battle. Then they just walk away and leave him there, like, <laughs> why, don't, why don't they take him back to their base or, or kill him? They're not very good villains, are they? The skinheads report exactly what we just saw to the Necromancer, and I don't know if it's just me, but her energy seems a lot lower in this scene. It's like she received some bad news while doing this. Or maybe she just realized how awful this film is. You know, it, it, it's, it's probably that. She tells them to kidnap Captain Battle and they leave and do that. After they leave, she, she does some magic. I, I, I think it's something to do with bringing back Hitler. But as usual with this film, I'm, I'm grasping at straws, trying to make sense of what's happening, feeling lost and confused. Sam pays another visit to the reporter and he informs Sam about some fellow called Gerald Collins, who's, who's apparently one of the richest people in the world. And he owns property, but it's not in his name. Sam goes home and goes to bed. And when he wakes up, Tank and Goatee are standing by his bed. They do to Sam what I wish I could do myself and, and punch him in the face until he's unconscious, which in Sam's case is, <laughs> is just once. We then watch him slowly drag him from his apartment and into their Honda. We even see Sam, Sam move his legs to aid the kidnappers shut the trunk. And we see him wake up in the car and get knocked out again. Why we see all this? I have no idea. Necromancer wakes Sam up in their lair, which, which is no mattress warehouse, but looks to be some kind of some kind of community center or, or youth club or something. Necromancer re-explains the plot she's already explained to Brandon and then just walks away. Sam easily <laughs> frees himself and instead of saving his friends just, just runs away. He gets home and gets a phone call from that reporter who explains that he knows the location of the baddies base but Sam tells him to shut up because he already knows and, and he just he just came back from there. Except he doesn't really say that he, he just kind of meekly tells him to call the police. Call the police you tell them everything that's been going down there okay. Then he gets his suit and eye patch on and heads back to the wolf so I guess his outfit is what gives him his confidence maybe. When he gets there he chokes out one of the three skinheads. While that's happening Brandon is walking around the base 
free. Like, he's not locked up or anything and, and just unties his sister. Two of the funniest looking police officers arrive at the scene and they look way more interesting than any other character in this movie. They shoot Tank and Goatee and you're left wishing the film was about them instead of Captain Loser. Sam confronts Necromancer by <laughs> grabbing her coat and you notice this is shot in the same alleyway as his first encounter with the skinheads from when Jane got kidnapped. Now, an idiot would say that this is a recycled location, that this is here because the producers were too lazy to get anywhere else. But as a seasoned film expert, I'm here to say that that is absolutely correct. Imla turns up and puts him in a bind. Necromancer injects him with anti-serum. Then she drives slowly away and Sam finally has his hero moment. He sees a big splinter of wood on the ground and he, he stabs Himmler with it, making him bleed all over the floor in probably the most anticlimactic villain death of all time. You, you can see the wood clearly go between his arms. But that's the whole point of Captain Battle Legacy War. You have to suspend your disbelief. You have to use your big brain. Now, you probably expect Captain Battle to pick himself up and carry on chasing Necromancer, determined to save the day. And with the fact that her boot was open, limiting how far she could go, odds on Captain Battle could probably catch up. But as he tends to do in the face of failure, Captain Battle decides to just, to just give up and go home. After that, we get a final scene where the characters plan what they're going to do next. And it's basically three minutes of, of sequel baiting for a sequel that, surprise, surprise, never happens. Can't imagine why. And then the film ends with freeze frames on their faces. Captain Battle Legacy War is bad. I, I bet you didn't expect me to say that. In some areas, it's better. There's more action in it than Thunderstorm Return of 4, although that really isn't hard. There's more activity going on in my nan's grave than Thunderstorm Return of 4. Most of the dialogue is mumbled and, and the sound is so awfully recorded you can hardly make out anything to even piece the plot together. This film had to have the blandest characters out of all the ones we've watched. At least Brett Kelly had some sense to give his film some sort of comic book vibe. Captain Battle is trying to be the most serious out of all the films so far and as a result is, is fucking boring. Now, here we are. The final stretch to the finish line. It feels like I've been taking part in a race where my legs have been getting progressively mangled. So by the time I can actually see the finish line, I'm in excruciating pain and I can't run. I can only crawl and I'm dragging myself towards Metal Man. I actually had to put quite a lot of effort in to find this movie because Metal Man can't be found on any streaming platforms like Netflix and I, I can't find anywhere to buy it. It isn't even on YouTube like the rest of these films. Actually, that, that's a lie. I, I, I managed to find it in German. What? Metal Man hides in the deep recesses of the web. The type of dingy corners you can only find if you use the words free and online in your web browser. Whoever was behind this production was, was not interested in having it seen by other people. The film begins with a man and woman in a darkened room who I, who I think are robbing a house or something. They get interrupted by Metal Man who looks more like Plastic Man. <laughs> He sounds like he's screaming for a kid's toy megaphone. He either says, I need transmat fuel or you need to stop it. it. It could be anything. Again, the audio is not very clean. In terms of the priority list that exists for these films, I assume audio that you can actually hear is, is probably right at the bottom. Actually, that might be giving them a bit too much credit. I, I don't think it's even on their list. Or I mean, fuck, I don't even know why I think they'd have a list. Either way, this scene has no narrative purpose and is never justified or contextualized. I've unfortunately watched the whole movie and I, I still don't know why it's there. I think it might just be there to, to show us a message. Metal Man, despite this scene having basically nothing to do with what this film's about. We then have an animated CGI battle sequence that looks fucking awful. And we then get the reveal. It's a video game that this kid is playing. After a chat with his parents, we understand this to be our main character, Kyle. They seem very supportive of Kyle and very relaxed. Look at their loose-fitting dressing gowns. This is not your normal average parents. As a bit of a hobbyist expert in body language and physical communication, I can tell you with absolute certainty these two are swingers. Kyle goes to the park on the way to work and, and there he runs off after Julie, his, I guess, female interest. He goes to this park every week and waits for her, and she is clearly uncomfortable with this arrangement. Kyle, who looks like Shane Dawson, had a child with Fred and Dexter, talks to Julie about his job as, a, as an intern for a scientist, and Julie doesn't really care about it, and tells Kyle she's skipping class to go to a sorority party because she's really cool. She's just using her social status against him, as Kyle has, has clearly never been allowed to any social group because he gets bullied for his parents being swingers, I'd assume. Now, Kyle's relationship with this scientist he's working with, as we find out in the next scene is, is weird. His name is Dr. Blake, but Kyle calls him Dr. B. They talk about Kyle's game that he made, which I assume is the game he was playing at the start. And Dr. B says he liked it, but isn't overly enamored with the name, Biodef. I, I don't know why, it's, it's, that's never explained. Dr. B forces Kyle to put on the Metal Man costume, and Kyle complains about his claustrophobia and being uncomfortable. Dr. Blake basically ignores him and locks him in a freezer. He then says he wishes he had more time before a knock at the door. The door opens, and we see three men of differentiating levels of baldness enter the room, and that makes four balls men in total. The leader of this group, an evil businessman named Sebastian, is giving Dr. Blake grief for changing his name and hiding the insane technology of Metal Man from him. He says he plans on stealing his technology, which will make him and a lot of militaries happy. You're going to make me and a lot of militaries very happy. 
Dr. Blake says, not in a pig's eye, whatever that means. Because you see, he's one of those hippie moralists who insists Metal Man wasn't created as a weapon, despite Metal Man literally being a weapon. We never actually managed to get an idea as to what it was created for other than combat, because that's all we see it do in the film. But it means so much to the professor that he dies for this cause. And the bad guys grab a spare Metal Man helmet he, he just has lying around, I guess. They can't get it working without the doctor's files, and they assume Kyle has them or knows where they are. Sebastian asks his folks to transfer the doctor's files and destroy his hard drive. So they, they don't really look like the type of people that would have the technical know-how to do so. Sebastian then asks them to, to go to Kyle's house and, and kill his family for some reason. So I guess they instead do that. Kyle is still in the fridge while this is all happening. After the bad guys go, Dr. B gets up and, and limps to the freezer to release Kyle from his living nightmare. But it only gets worse. The doctor tells Kyle that the Metal Man suit is fused to his skin now. And he, he will never be able to remove it. Oh no, and he's trapped in there forever. So now the doctor has permanently trapped Kyle inside a Metal Man suit without his consent. And it was at this point in Metal Man. And I was, I was beginning to, to maybe in, enjoy it a little bit. Even though it was messy and in an absolutely awful quality, it was pacey. We managed to reach the actual point where the story is going to start happening relatively quickly. And the setup is, is kind of interesting. Like, dude's had a suit permanently merged to his skin. That's, that's fucking interesting. And this aspect of it doesn't make it feel as much of a direct Iron Man ripoff as previous films we've looked at. Despite, I mean... Yeah. It is a ripoff. Things get even more wacky as Dr. Blake uploaded an AI version of himself to Kyle's suit. Meaning as well as depriving Kyle from human touch, he's also forced him to spend the rest of his life with a, a weird old man he barely knows inside of his head, staring at him and, and telling him what to do. The doctor explains that the suit is filled up with nanobots, which are now part of him and, and inside his brain. They have a number of epic features, including wishing away claustrophobia by, by saying it doesn't exist. The doctor shows him how he can present his human form by making the suit invisible. And then Kyle sets off to check on his parents. Parents, they're dead. The cronies are waiting for Kyle and he uses his new Metal Man abilities to overpower them without struggle. The crybaby pussy oh Dr. B is begging Kyle not to kill them. So he spares them and, and they run into the garden and, and do more fighting with some B-Tech ninjas. But to be honest, this is the best action sequence out of any of these four movies. The choreography is, dare I say, half decent. But to be fair, it is pretty easy to win a race when no one else is wearing shoes. Next we get a 10 minute long villain scene which is all one scene but it's kind of like four different scenes because there are so many different characters entering and leaving. First Sebastian Berates the fellas for their failure. You end up killing his family. And you come back empty handed. Two women come in. One of them, Marissa, is the daughter of the man who invented Metal Man and is working for Sebastian as his scientist. The other woman, Diane, is Marissa's assistant. They tell Sebastian that the nanobots inside the helmet they stole are in status and the helmet won't work without the files, which we which we already sort of knew. Sebastian then has a dinner date with Marissa where they talk about Kyle. Marissa's done some incognito research tests on Kyle. The tests show he's a legend and a genius with a sense of right and wrong off the charts. Marissa can't understand why Kyle. Kyle would kill his mentor and parents. Sebastian, who is obviously the guy that did that, then encourages Marissa to seduce Kyle for more information. Kyle is young, rather inexperienced, full of hormones, and that is kryptonite. But where is Kyle hiding out? In another backup lab, of course. The Doctor is breaking the great news to him that one of the features of having the Metal Man suit is, is he will never have to eat again. Kyle is sensibly upset at this as he can't have another Greg's ever again. The Doctor tells him that he knows this sounds insensitive, but the sooner you accept your role in life, the happier you'll be. Shut up. Kyle gets his, his green goo and puts it in a sucky hole at the back of his head and slurps it all up. Apparently the goo tastes disgusting, but that's what Kyle has to eat now and he better get used to it. Then Kyle showcases his newest power, the ability to make himself look like another guy. He changes into his DLC skin who looks like a, a deeply down on his luck musician. Ten seconds after leaving the lab, he bumps into a guy who, who straight up just, just wants a fight. So Kyle knees him in the balls and runs away like, like a real hero. Then we get another 10 minute long Sebastian scene. Yay. This time though, no more Mr. Nice Guy. He berates Marissa, drags in Diane and shoves the helmet on her, which, which kills her to death. It, it was something to do with the nanobots not working right. Sebastian makes it clear that he wants a working helmet, which he's been saying since the beginning. Kyle leaves his hideout for some reason and the guy he bumped into earlier is outside waiting for him w with a gun. The guy is so upset about Kyle bumping into him that he now wants to kill him. Kyle turns on his bulletproof shield and deflects the bullets like I deflect negative feedback. As he's driving, the bad men intercept him and Kyle gets out and fights them. This action sequence is nearly identical to the first one. He fights the same people in the same environment with, with the same Dr. B begging him not to kill anyone. But the B-Tech ninjas even come back. Right after this, Kyle somehow steals a nice white car and he, he drives to Sebastian's house. I, I don't know how he found out where he lived, 
but he did. He gets there and gets talking to Marisha, and there's some kind of reveal about her father, either Dr. B is her father, or, or Sebastian killed her father, and Carl knew that. It's one of those things. Sebastian comes in with a gun to shoot them or something. This should be pretty easy for Metal Man, though. I mean, we've seen what he can do to bullets. We've seen him handling the threat of a gun before. But Sebastian keeps talking about leverage, which he's done over multiple scenes. He loves having leverage. Sebastian's leverage is Kyle's female interest, Julie. He's got her tied up to a machine where if he doesn't come back in time, it will kill her. So they all walk back into this room and they discuss their terms. Sebastian orders Marissa to remove the suit or the files or, or whatever from Kyle's suit, but she doesn't. She instead puts a turkey baster into Kyle's arm and sucks up his blood. She then goes back into the room and injects Sebastian with it, which buys Kyle enough time to rescue Julie and, and turn invisible. Except he, he hasn't got enough power, so he really goes half invisible, which means there was literally no point <laughs> to them trying at all. But there's no point in being half invisible. But anyway, they escape to some random barn. At the barn, Julie is basically asleep and Kyle strokes her hair and tries to tries to get her to wake up. But then Kyle starts to pass out just as she wakes up. She freaks out and runs away because I guess it's all too much for her. Kyle passes out and has a really intense dream. He dreams that he's fully human again and none of the terrible stuff has happened to him and that Julie is with him and, and, and in love with him. When he wakes up, the nightmare of his reality only becomes worse. Julie has abandoned him alone in the barn after he saved her life. But at this point, Kyle barely even cares. Dr. B tells him to get up and that he still has enough energy for one fight left in him, but he needs to make it count because it's only one. Kyle gets out into the farm where, where Sebastian and Marissa are waiting for him. How did they know where to where to find Kyle? He asks and Sebastian says he knew because he owns the farm. Th that doesn't really explain. But this is just the start of a scene with a lot of unexplained shit going on. Next to Sebastian, there's another metal man, but he's green. They've never once shown or mentioned this other suit until this scene. Marissa is also wearing the helmet they stole, but unlike Diane, or Di Diana, I can't remember her name, is actually alive. I don't, I don't really understand why Sebastian has her wearing it, but she is and she, she doesn't say anything. Metal Man and Green Metal Man have a scrap. Neither of the actors in the Metal Man costumes are able to see, so it's like two old blind men scrapping it out in a car park over who's better, the Scarab or Captain Battle. Metal Man kills the other um, Metal Man. Sebastian opens his gym bag and pull, pulls out a fourth Metal Man helmet. I, I have no idea where that came from. Are these Metal Man helmets really that easy to produce? When Sebastian puts it on, Marissa asks Kyle for the helmet activation code. You probably don't know what it is and neither did I at the time, because the helmet activation code is, is barely mentioned in the film. You literally see it for a second whilst Kyle's locked in the freezer in the opening. But it's this code that is the final weapon against Sebastian because I think if the code comes from a source other than the wearer, it, it self-destructs. It's something like that. Marissa says the code and Sebastian melts. Get in! Kyle and Marissa awkwardly hug because I guess they're together now. Because, you know, what, what is the point in all of this if you don't get a girlfriend at the end? And that brings this series of reviews, this reflection of the straight-to-DVD industry and some of its contributions to the superhero genre to a close. Why and how these films are put together is completely elusive. How they make money, so much in fact that the creators of these movies often see it worthwhile to make many of them, is a complete mystery to me. All of them basically fill out their runtime with exposition and all of them pretty much fail at landing any type of comprehensive or sensible ending and all of them have poorly performed and terribly written characters. All these elements are so off the mark that even the entertainment factor from these films being bad is, is pretty fucking low. So in conclusion, my favourite was Avenging Force then Metal Man, then Captain Battle, then way, 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 way down in the Earth's Molten Core 4. That movie was so shit. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe if you're new. I'm gonna go have a lie down.